Duke. Hi there, Duke fans. Episode 615 of the DBR podcast, Duke Basketball Roundup. I'm Jason Evans. Can you hear me okay? I want to apologize right <laughs> off the bat. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is what happens when I don't record with Donald, right? This is this is the problem. <laughs> so I'm Scott, the magic marker here. I'm the, the one. Brings the voice. <laughs> so yeah, Scott Rich and I recorded last night. I hope most of you got a chance to listen to that, that sort of instant reaction kind of thing that we had. And unfortunately, my mic wasn't working properly. I, you know, after we were done recording, I sat down at my computer to do a little bit of editing and I was like, I can't hear myself. Where am I? <laughs> um, I did my best, folks. I'm, I I apologize. I apologize. You know, sometimes in, sometimes in the moment after the Blue Devils have won a big game, all the... Uh, all the gremlins aren't working quite properly for us. So anyway, <laughs> I'm Jason Evans, and uh, I want to thank you for joining me today because I have my buddy Donald Wine with me. That that little uh, poor audio episode, I hope, has tided all of you over for the past, uh, not quite, 20, about 20 hours or so. <laughs> and now yeah. Donald and I are ready to, to give the full rundown of the Blue Devils' absolute destruction of James Madison. Donald, why don't you tell folks why you weren't with us last night? Um, and why Scott Scott had to fill in for you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I was at the U.S.-Mexico game, the CONCACAF Nations League final uh, in at Jerry World in Arlington, Texas. Uh, I was there, and the game, the great thing, Jason, is I was able to watch the full game uh, for Duke before going into the stadium. But the problem was, right after the game was over, I had to go into the stadium to watch that game. Uh, I will say, shout out to the Duke women. They, they, they beat Ohio State. Yeah, get to the Sweet Sixteen. That was a great. Then game. big then, comeback there. Yeah, one of the biggest comebacks in NCAA, at least the first couple rounds of the NCAA women's tournament. So uh, incredible. Got to watch that. Then got to watch this fun game uh, that the Duke men had. And then U.S. goes inside. I go inside and watch the U.S. beat Mexico two to nothing. As Ice Cube would say, Jason, yesterday it was a good day. Oh yeah. Oh that that is an <laughs> understatement, sir. Yes. Uh, and I apologize if we don't give the women enough enough credit around here. Uh, but th they had a they had a fabulous win. Come from behind on the road at a team like Ohio State, truly impressive. If you haven't been paying attention to what the women are doing, they are also in the Sweet Sixteen. I haven't counted, Donald. I'm sure someone out there can tell us there are there are not a lot of schools that has two teams in the Sweet Sixteen. I mean, UConn is obviously one of them. <laughs> UConn plays tonight as we record. In, in while yeah. they have not won yet, uh, it is it is they are the they are the heavy favorites. Let's say that yes. They, yeah, the heavy favorites to be Duke's opponent uh, in the women's side in Portland. Um, but hey, that you know, after that that side had been all chalk, like the the women's tournament. I think there was only one upset in the first round, yeah. and then Duke was one of several in the second round. So hey, it could happen. And if we face UConn, then that's that's bad news for them. Maybe uh, maybe we can go out there to, and, and pull off another upset. Yeah, exactly. Boy, speaking of chalk, really quick before we get to the the Duke James Madison game. So now that we're done with uh, the men's first two rounds, four number one seeds, four number two seeds are still alive. Two number mm -hmm. threes, two number fours, a couple fives, and then Clemson and NC State. It is a super, super chalky bracket. I mean, like, it's kind of crazy. And, and uh, you know, with all those in a year of upsets, a year where we did nothing but talk about how hard it is to win on the road and all those other kind of things, suddenly we got all these one and two seeds <laughs> In the in the Sweet 16, it is only the fifth time since 1979 that all the one and two seeds made the Sweet 16. Jason, my bracket. I know you, uh, you and Scott talked about your brackets quickly uh, on the episode yesterday. Uh, my brackets in a 97.5th percentile. Uh, I have 12 out of 16 of the uh, sweet of the Sweet 16 correct, and my Elite Eight and Final Four and National Champion obviously is still intact. So um, I'm all for Chuck. Uh, I mean, obviously, we're going to need to start separating some of this chalk uh, uh, this week in the Sweet 16 and Lead 8. But as of right now, I'm happy with where we are. Yeah, I am, I am also in the 97.5th percentile. We both have uh, equal uh, equal picks, although I, I have lost one Elite 8 team. I lost Kentucky. Lost them a while ago. <laughs> yeah. But other than felt that. Like, my... felt like weeks ago. It's yeah, not, exactly. It was like three days ago. Other than that, my bracket is doing pretty darn well. Uh, all right. So let's get to. This game, the Duke James Madison game, that's what we're here for. And by the way, folks, so you're aware of what's going to be going on this week. Uh, so Donald and I are going to do our full recap right now. We'll be looking ahead after this. We will start turn our attention and really look ahead to Houston 
We're probably going to be at least one, maybe two podcasts previewing the game against the Houston Cougars, which is a very big deal. So we'll be in your feeds a lot. But before we do all that, we need to talk about James Madison. And I'll begin, Donald. I, I can't even count. I, I don't know the exact number. We've never gotten this many email headlines from the listeners. It It is just, I, I think it had to be higher than like 50 or 60. Just, Jason, when yeah. I when I logged in this morning, I, I told you this. I logged in and I had all my work stuff, all my, you know, my junk emails and stuff. I had 320 unread emails this morning at 5 a.m. And 76 of them were headlines <laughs> to the DVR uh, podcast at gmail.com. So thank you so much, everybody. I, I apologize. I could not get through all of them in the limited time I've had. Um, I did, but that's why Jason is here for you because yes. Jason is here to pick out some of the some of the good ones. I did, so I gave some of them last night. I'm going to give you a few more. There's some very very good stuff, and just so we understand, the bar is high, <laughs> the bar is very high to make mm -hmm. it onto the podcast today. James Bond Baumgartner gave me McDuke McDominates McDukes. I like that one. Chuck Westmoreland. I, I, by the way, I'm just I'm digging these these folks who who saw the words James Madison and went back to the Constitution. Chuck Westmoreland gave us "We the Threeple." <laughs> <laughs> we the that one was a good one. Duke's Constitution is strong and dominant win over James Madison. But I love the "We the Threeple." That's very funny. Uh, Charles Lee, who by the way goes by K's K A Z E on the DBR boards, a great poster on the DBR boards, gave us a little bit of alliteration. Devils dominate the Dukes and dance onto Dallas. Um, James Allen gave us J.M. Who. Uh, Dave Gorett gave us 38 reasons to believe in Duke in reference to the uh, Blue Devils winning this game by 38 points. J.W. Barnhill. Uh, this is another one that I just love this. McCain versus Madison. <laughs> Duke's make, Duke making a federal case out of it. I thought that was clever. <laughs> Little uh, Yeah, Donald, you're a lawyer. <laughs> that one was good. Yeah, that, that is a clever one, uh, referencing a very famous Supreme Court case, Marbury versus Madison. Uh, Jackson Blower, who is a first-time headline writer. And we had, by the way, we had at least 10 people who say, I'm a first-time headline writer, and I usually try and get those. Too many of them. And you got to be good. You got to bring it. So Jackson brought it. He said, I'm going to try and do this. This is not an easy one to read. Ready? McCain's marvelous moment. Duke Blue Devils defeat James Madison Dukes in dazzling display of Duke's basketball brilliance. <laughs> good not, job jason way to read that even. first time no um, no no second take no second take on that one and then i love it we're getting limericks donald we're getting more and more limericks courtney Kruger gave us a limerick okay there once was a lad named mccain threes he knew how to rain he shot lights out the game was a rout with 16 the devils remain courtney, wow courtney Kruger. i'm pretty sure courtney has sent in uh, a limerick before right jason yes uh courtney you might need to start just chronicling the season and then just put it in a book and just just put that book out with just the limericks of the of the headlines from each game this season i think that'd be pretty cool to read i mean that was amazing and then the last thing i wanted to mention that we got from the dbr podcast at gmail.com inbox chris henrickson sent a question sent a comment he said you know if we all don't get our nails done in solidarity with Jared McCain before the Sweet 16, aren't we just missing an opportunity here? Um, so I'm going to go out there and go ahead and say it. If you go out and get your nails done in some wild, wacky way, send us a picture of it and we will talk about it because <laughs> Jared McCain certainly deserves a little bit of respect from the Duke community for, for the performance he put on. And Jason is weird because uh, I believe before the first game um, against Vermont, he, he guess he was in transition of what he wanted because he didn't have uh like the nail paint, yeah. uh, nail nail polish on. Uh, I think he had the clear coat that you kind of put down before you you know really go go to work. Uh, but Jason, I, uh, there was one other headline that I wanted to point out that you weren't able to. It comes from Brandon Johnson. He sent it in, but it's from his son Carlisle, his seven year old son Carlisle, who wrote who said this while eating sweet potato fries. He wrote. Sweet potatoes are sweet, so Jerry McCain can make sweet shots and get to the Sweet 16. Carlisle, I loved that one. I, 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 I just thought that was very wholesome, and it tells the whole story of this game. Jason, Jerry McCain hit a lot of shots. Duke played sweet, and that's why we are in the Sweet 16. All right, Donald, I've sort of already done a little bit of commentary in this game on the previous episode, so I'm going to mm -hmm. leave it to you. We are now into the good and the bad. 
and start the good wherever you want. Uh, I I think personally, I think it's the defense. But you go ahead and you 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 tell me where you want to begin your conversation about the good in this game. Jason, let me start off with an overall comment, and I'm going to borrow from Mike Lowry from Bad Boys. Now that's how you're supposed to play. From now on, that's how you play. This game, we scored 16 that. seconds into the game and had to lead the rest of the game. We played hard. I think uh, you I think either you or Scott yesterday mentioned that the uh, halftime uh halftime interview with John Shire, he mentioned like eight times that they played super hard. That yeah. is that was clear. Um any any notion that we were going to come out flat, gone in the first 16 seconds. We shot well. It, it, we can start with the defense cuz I think I thought the defense was great. We you know, we out rebounded them. We held them. Just it, it just felt like every time uh, James Madison was going to come down and do something, they had no answer. We were able to block a shot or go the, or steal and go the other way. What do we have? Twelve steals. We talked about how in the first game James Madison had fourteen steals in Wisconsin. How that was just an electric number. We almost matched it against them, and that took away a lot of their momentum and took away a lot of their speed and and, and neutralized whatever momentum that you get by being a 12 seed going up against you know the 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 blue blood that is duke university i'm sure the whole arena outside of the duke fans were really like yo let's get james madison on the board let's get behind him and we gave them nothing to think about after the first media timeout that game was basically over at that point it felt like it because that's how well we were playing and and i thought the defense was incredible Jason, I think the defense was even more incredible in the last 10 minutes of the game. We outscored JMU 22 to nine. So when there was a point where you're like, hey, JMU could make a run and make this close and maybe give uh, a little bit of momentum and give everybody in the country something to think about. Duke said, no, time is up. It's time for you to go home now. Thanks for playing. Good night. Yeah. And, you know, you you mentioned, first of all, regarding those 10 minute segments of the game, the quarters of the game. Duke won every single one of those quarters of the mm-hmm. game. You you were talked about, you know, John Shire and what he said at halftime. I, I want to talk about what John Shire said after the game. Cause he said that Duke took some time after the ACC tournament. He said having the extra time from losing, you know, on Thursday and pl- not playing till Friday, having that extra time gave the team time to look in the mirror. He said the game can humble you and that Duke needed a little bit of that. He said that these guys got focused. They said, we got to learn how to play hard for all 40 minutes. The fact that they won all those 10-minute segments each quarter of the game is a sign of a team that is hard, that is playing hard and focused for all of those 40 minutes. And, I mean, if you ask John Shire, I almost think that he maybe thinks it was a blessing that Duke lost to NC State early that it lit a fire under these guys that hasn't been there all year long. And then getting back to the defense that I was talking about earlier, you know, we held our opponent opponent 29 points below their season average. That's ridiculous. That's, that's crazy. And it wasn't like Duke was playing super slow. It wasn't like this was a Virginia kind of performance where we're like, oh, we're going to take a lot of time and that's how we'll hold them down. No, we held them 29 points below their season average because we were har- harassing them, hounding them, forcing turnovers, forcing them into bad shots, making the de- game difficult on them. And you know how great our defense was? I want to point this out. It's easy to come out of that game and think Duke got hot from three. I mean, look, I mean, what Jared McCain did was outrageous. Duke hit 50% of their three-pointers against a team in James Madison. We talked about in the preview. One of the best three-point defensive teams in the country. James Madison has won an ungodly number of games this year because it is super hard to hit threes against them. Duke hit 50% of their threes in the game. And it's easy to go, that's the story of the game. I'm going to tell you something, you're wrong. You know why that's wrong? Because if Duke hadn't hit 50% of their threes, let's say we'd been just normal, reasonable, like we hit 35% of our threes, which is a very average kind of number for Duke. Instead of going 14 of 28 from three, we'd gone 10 of 28. That's right at 35%. I got news for you. Duke still wins this game by 25 plus points. (laughs) If we, if we only hit 35% of our threes, I I mean, that's how great our defense was. That's why I think defense was the story of this game. And yeah, part of it is you can't take the two apart because when you're clicking on offense, the way we were, it makes it easier to play defense. 
and and vice versa. You know, you feed off either end of the floor. But I really think to me, the story of this game, the story of this weekend of the tournament was that this Duke team that all season long has seemed to be eh, a little lackluster, hasn't lived up to preseason expectations. This Duke team finally showed us what they can be because they played hard. They shared the ball. They, they did things defensively as a team that they really haven't been doing all year. They look like the team we expected them to be. I want to remind everybody it's super quick. There were four teams, clearly one through four in the preseason AP poll. It was Kansas, Duke, Purdue, and Michigan State. And all year long, Purdue's been the only one of those teams that really played up to expectations. Duke is starting to join the party. Absolutely. And I think, you know, Jason, one of your favorite stats, uh, field goal attempts. We took 13 more shots than they did. That is a testament to how suffocating our defense was. We Again, we had forced 14 turnovers. We had 12 of them were steals. And this is not a team that steals the ball a lot or our steel position, you know, or you know, the way we we do defense, we trying to force teams into taking bad shots and getting rebounds and going the other way, as opposed to taking it from them and going the other way. Well, we were taking the ball from them left and right. And again, any single time it felt like James Madison was about to make a run or maybe could string a couple of possessions together, we would take the ball away from them. We'd go down the other end and we'd score. And it was apparent. But Jason, I know we've talked about defense. I I I do want to talk about the offense and i want to talk about jerry mccain because you sure that display <laughs> you ready was historic <laughs> that display was historic in several ways again 30 points eight for 11 from three five rebounds one assist one steal zero turnovers let me just give you some superlatives jason jerry mccain made eight three-pointers as i mentioned including his first six in the opening 20 minutes that is a new duke record for three-pointers in the ncaa tournament bettering the seven that Quinn Cook did against Mercer in 2014. I'm sure Quinn Cook in more ways than one would love is loving the fact that he concede that record to Jared McCain, because of course we know that game that he hit seven threes and it's not a game that we like to talk about. McCain had 22 first half points. He almost outscored JMU in the first half by himself. Most, most by any player in the NCAA tournament so far this year, the first freshman, since the NCAA tournament expanded to 64 teams to score 30 points with no turnovers. He I, heard is that, a, he I heard is, that, by the way, I heard that when, and I was like, my jaw hit the floor. We're talking about, in, we're talking about yeah. stuff that, that, that hasn't happened since before Jared was born. <laughs> right. Like not just, but wait, 20 years before he was born, they haven't had anyone do this. It's, it's amazing. He he is entering stratosphere, and, and I, I'm sure you saw the stat. The Duke players that had 30 points and five rebounds in a tournament game, Jerry McCain, Zion Williamson, Christian Leitner, and Danny Ferry. That's it. He's on that. And I think, Jason, the most important thing, or at least the funniest Man. thing, uh, per Wikipedia, the new name of JMU was Jerry McCain University because he owned them yesterday. That it, it, the, the way that he spurred this team with his, with his shot, uh, with his shots, was just incredible. He was having fun out there. I know you guys talked about how he doesn't feel like this team has had a lot of fun this year playing basketball. And this yesterday was fun for a lot of people, myself included. This was a fun game and Jerry McCain led that. But Jason, just the fact that we were able to make threes, as you mentioned, against a team that does not allow them really, I think that's probably the thing that really put JMU on their heels because they're like, Hey, at least, you know, maybe our shots aren't falling, but we can rely on the fact that we're going to let them take a lot of threes and they're not going to make them. Uh Oh, this dude is making all of his threes. This dude is not missing. What is happening here? Jared McCain and in, just inspired a lot of what they were doing. And the fact that he got hot early meant that we got on a tear. And at that point, it just, the floodgates opened up for everybody else. Yeah. And it was, it was a joy to watch. And McCain was absolutely incredible, but I, I don't want to only talk about him. <laughs> yes. Uh, I because... will say, Jason, on the threes real quick. Yeah. Did you know that we made more three-pointers than free throws yesterday? I mean, that's ridiculous. Come on. <laughs> we had 14 threes, and we had – and it's not like we shot – you know, terribly from the free throw line, but we only had 13, we only made 13 free throws. So we had 14 threes and 13 free throws. Add those up. That's two points per thing, uh, per uh, per uh, shot. That's a lot of threes. And the fact that we hit him at a 50% rate and hit so many of them 
really just made this game where it was a bloodbath very, very early on that never dissipated. And that's what made it fun for a lot of fans. Well, I was going to say the, the, the sharing of the ball to me was the story. Oh, yeah. of the game Cause most of those threes, there are a couple of them that came, you know, Jared, especially had a couple that he hit on his own, but for the most part, it was passing beautiful passing, really good screening, uh, deep tees. I'm going to tell you right now, when we get to play the game, I'm going to spend a little bit of time and, you're going to hear a interesting description of some of these Jared McCain three pointers. That is going to be my play of the game. I I did a deep dive on these, but the point I'm making about this is the the degree to which Duke was playing like a team is just something we haven't seen all year. Uh, again, the screening and the passing was leading to these open shots again and again and again. It wasn't just that we were hitting them at a high rate. I don't think we took a bad three. No, it wasn't a single one that was forced. Heck, for that matter, I don't think there was a single one where the guy wasn't pretty much wide open. I mean, and they weren't bad misses either, right? It wasn't like we we hit one where it was like, oh man, what a terrible shot! It like barely grazed iron. Like all of them were really good shots. They either went in or they went off the rim. And and, and Jason, a lot of them, we got the offensive rebound and was able to go back up and maybe shoot another three and make it or make another shot. But every shot was taken in the rhythm and the flow of the offense. Yeah, look, it, it, it's something I mentioned yesterday. The fact that the fact that Duke assisted on 22 of our 33 buckets <laughs> is ridiculous. It's a huge <laughs> number. For an NCAA tournament game against a team like James Madison that plays really good defense that usually doesn't allow you to move the ball around and get the shots you want, Duke got the shot they wanted again, 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 again. It was it was ridiculous. It was, uh, you know, an out-of-body experience almost to watch this team playing this well. And the guy that led it, the guy who I think was responsible for it more than anybody else, was Jeremy Roach, who, come on, I mean, six assists and no turnovers from Jeremy Roach after he busted up his finger? And we haven't gotten the final, you know, I hope that there's nothing serious there. Just suppose it was a dislocation and they and they dealt with it. But, man, I thought, you know, Jeremy Roach only took eight shots in this game. He, he he hit five of them, by the way. <laughs> yes. Pretty decent percentage. Uh, but, you know, he wasn't shooting. He wasn't looking to score quite as much as he sometimes does. But he facilitated in a way that I haven't seen him do all year long. And and I should and we should also shout out Tyrese Proctor, who who had five assists and only one turnover. So our, our two lead guards, the guys who had the ball in their hand for the vast majority of the game, 11 assists, one turnover. That's going to win a lot of games for you, Donald. Jason, I, I think you understated, I think, both of these guys. But let me start with Jeremy Roach for a second. Let me just go through what this man did yesterday. 15 points, as you mentioned, five for eight from the floor. He made all four of his free throws, one rebound, a team-high six assists, two steals, a plus-minus of plus 30, and he played 34 and a half minutes, as you mentioned, most of that with a dislocated finger. Let me tell you how hard it is. If you, if my, I've not dislocated his finger, but I have like sprained it, you know, sprained a thumb or something like that. Let me tell you what hurts the most is when you are standing at the free throw line, just you, the ball, and everyone else trying to hope that you miss a, an uncontested free throw. Everything in your hand is throbbing at that moment, and you have to somehow suppress that and make make your free throw and, and do your business. He was able to do that the entire game with a dislocated finger. I think that is something that should not be understated. That man put in a warrior's shift yesterday, and it is very much appreciated. And I hope that it, it, that he's able to rest that finger and they're able to, to give it the treatment that he needs so that he can be ready to go. Tyrese Proctor, you mentioned the assists, you know, five assists of his own, three rebounds, four threes and 18 points. When Proctor makes at least three threes in a game, Duke is 13 and one. So that is as much as it is, it is important for him to be distributing the basketball when he's making shots, it's usually the, the, it, the floodgates, as I mentioned, is open for everybody else, because when he's making shots, we are winning ball games at a tremendous clip. And so it's very it's very important to not, you know, again, it, it felt like he was in a way being aggressive on offense, but he wasn't, you know head hunting right he wasn't glory hunting with his shot everyone who was shooting on the perimeter was finding shots that were open as you mentioned they were finding each other who if, if they weren't open they'd find another guy 
getting offensive rebounds, finding guys open for threes. And I think that was the backbreakers that we had in, in, bulk, in bulk for James Madison. Anytime these guys shot a three, it would either go in or we'd get an, another opportunity, it felt like. And because of that, this team w- was just the, – the guards were w- – we've talked about the guard play and how erratic it's been all year. This is one that we need to really stand up and give them a standing ovation for how they play because they played beautifully yesterday. Hey, you know, the other thing, the other stat that we haven't talked about is uh, is the rebounding. And, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I talked about it a little bit yesterday. I, I felt like this was a really great team rebounding effort. Like there was no one guy who stood out who you go, oh, that guy got 12 boards or something like that. But it was the kind of game where like everybody had like four, five, six rebounds, just player after player after player was was helping out on the boards. I mean, like, look, come on, Jared McCain gets five defensive rebounds. I mean, Ryan Young gets three offensive rebounds. Just uh, again, it was a it was a team effort. And that to me is the thing that's sticking out the most. The fact that in every aspect of the game, you felt like these Duke guys were playing together, were working together, were showing effort together, were playing like they knew where each other were going to be in a way that we just we haven't seen enough of this year. It was very, very impressive. Talk to me, you know, I mentioned... I mentioned Ryan Young there. Talk to me about the bench play a little bit. Yeah, and I know you guys covered this a bit also yesterday, but for to add my comments, I thought the bench played beautifully in making sure there was no drop-off in the energy and the hustle and all of those details when they enter the game. And I know uh, there was a point where Kyle Filipowski had four fouls. It, it seemed fairly early in the, in the second half. Um, I, I guess it was maybe like halfway through the second half, but at that point it was over, right? That It was because when the when the bench came in, they were able to offer things uh, yeah. in other departments, right? I, I know uh, Sean Stewart had five points, and and four of them were very, very, very above the rim. Um, we love that, <laughs> very above the rim. Um, to man, I, I think I think he still has not come down from that set, from that one dunk uh, that he had. But uh, the, they both, as you mentioned, Ryan Young, he had six rebounds. Sean Stewart also had six rebounds, and so again, when you're when the game is as fun as that one was. It's because everyone's coming off the bench and they're like, how do I get a piece of the action? Right. It's 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 uh, the stock market when the, when the stocks are going up and everyone's like, oh, let me get in. Let me, let me buy. Let me buy. Let me buy. This is what it was. Every time somebody checked into the game, they checked in with the same bad intentions as the guy who was leaving the court saying, hey, the the, the bad intentions of, of, of having fun in this game. I transfer that to you for these next few minutes while you're on this floor. And so that constant was was amazing to see. And as you mentioned, no matter who was on the floor. Everyone was working together. I know we'll talk about Jalen Blakes as well. Jalen Blakes, I thought he, in the time that he was in the game, was simply sensational in the fact that, again, he was a hornet's nest on defense. He was causing chaos, and he was actively trying to get in get in, in on the action, on the fun. Um, and, unfortunately, I, I hope he's okay uh, with that. Uh, and that, is one the, of, the, that was one of the most brutal falls that I've seen in a basketball game in quite a while. I know on the broadcast they were sort of questioning, like, should it be a a flagrant? I, yeah, I, and I didn't think it should have been. Uh, well, I'll tell you why I think it probably should have been. Here's the thing. When a guy is going up in the air like that at full speed and you collide into him at full speed, which is what happened there, mm-hmm. I think that is so dangerous. I mean, yeah, there was nothing specific that uh, whatever that guy's name is, uh, Friedel, I think is his name. Um, there yeah. was nothing specific that he was doing that that looks like it's all that bad but the, again the speed of their two bodies created a really dangerous situation flagrants to me exist to protect players and when Jalen Blakes was moving at that speed and uh and Noah Friedel was moving at that speed it created a situation that was not safe for Jalen Blakes I'm glad he wasn't more banged up than he was I was terrified he had I thought when he got up that he was going to be like wobbling I was sure he had a concussion the fact that they say he didn't I think is a small miracle well, I know he entered the protocol. His head hit the ground twice. Like his head broke his fall and then bounced up and bounced back down again. The reason why I say, and again, this is, uh, I agree with what you're saying as far as like the rules are meant to keep players safe. And that was a, a moment that ended up not safe for one of our players, right? And and it could have been just as bad for Noah Friedel. That was a bad collision. Uh, both of them fell uh, fairly awkwardly, but he, you know, J- Jalen Blakes took the brunt of that. For me, I think that the, in my eyes, the flagrancy of the foul does not come from the result of it. 
And I think that is where a lot of people like it wouldn't have been You're a flagrant wrong. foul, wrong. right? It, it wouldn't have been a flagrant foul if he had fallen and you know just kind of landed on his butt and got back up, right? But because he landed on his head, it becomes something where people go, "Oh, we need to look at this because it's a flagrant foul." It was, I, I think, it was a hard foul. I think, as you mentioned, going he he, you know, Jalen Blake's just going for a dunk, ladies and gentlemen. That's, I mean, this is how this collision happened. He was going again. He was trying to get in on the fun, and it just ended up in the worst possible way uh, for him. But uh, I. I, I don't have an issue with I don't call that a dirty play or anything like that. I don't call that a flagrant foul. I just call that a very hard foul where a very serious moment occurred. And thankfully, it wasn't as serious as it looked uh, when we saw it happen in real time. So hopefully Jalen Blakes is going to be OK. And, and again, thankfully, we have a few days for him to clear what any cobwebs out of his out of his mind that he may have from that fall. Uh, and hopefully he's back to 100% because I thought, again, the time that he was in the game, man, he was awesome at being the chaos creator and, and making it where JMU could not get anything on the perimeter because of how he was playing. All right, Donald, we're about to wrap up the good, I think. And I'm going to let you talk about our ball handling. 22 assists and 33 buckets. We already mentioned that. Just six turnovers. Just six turnovers? Come on. Come on. John Shire said it was the best passing game of the year for Duke. I am not going to disagree with John Shire. Nope, I'm not either. And I think the b- most important part of that, Jason, is that we took care of the basketball. When And I think they had the stat wrong, right? When I think I think it was uh, Tyrese Proctor uh, had a turnover very, very late in the first half. And they said, that's Duke's first turnover. It was their second. But the point remains is we're nitpicking over the fact that they had two turnovers in the first half when we've had some t- halves where they've had 10. Um, because we haven't been taking care of the basketball. We've been throwing the ball away and stuff. And even those plays that were turnovers, it was us trying to, again, have some fun moment and try to create something that would have been a highlight real thing and you know just missing. But the way we took care of the basketball while also breaking down JMU with our passing, we've talked about how important it is for us to have an assist rate above 50%. We've only lost one time this year where that has been the case. And this time around, it felt like it was a concerted effort to – Make sure everyone got open shots. And again, Jason, we're not talking about this if we're not shooting the ball as well as we did, right? I think part of the fact that we had 22 assists is because 22 buckets went down and 14 of them felt like it was threes. Like Those things all compiled together to create fun moments. And I think the passing and get in, in seeing how the bench reacted to it, right? There were some times where you'd see guys, you know, play ping pong with the ball all the way around the floor and it ends up with Tyrese Proctor in the corner, Jared McCain on the wing. And as soon as he went up, you see the whole bench basically going, that ball is in. And it's a, there was a lot of team moments in this, which is why it's going to be hard to kind of pick a play of the game um, and why I'm, I'm very curious to see what yours is. But there was a lot of team moments in some of these plays where it, it just felt like the, the great thing about it is that that team, that team ball, was rewarded time and time again. I like that. I like that. All right, we're going to take a quick break. On the other side, we've teased it, play of the game coming up, and we'll look at the bad. There are a couple little things that I do want to mention about this game. Hard to imagine that from a 38-point loss that you could say there are things to work on, but, you know, we got it. We got to, you know, bring the good and the bad. We'll have that after this quick commercial break. This episode of the DBR is brought to you by BetterHelp. Hey, everybody. This is Jason Evans of the Duke Basketball Roundup podcast. You know, the truth is I'd be lying if I told you I didn't have stuff to work on (laughs) all my life. I've had a great passion for the things that I wanted to do, like this podcast, but not as much for the things that I was supposed to do. And honestly, it used to get me in trouble sometimes, but some years ago, I started talking about it with a therapist, and and it really helped. And I learned to embrace the supposed to, not just the want to. And frankly, my life is better for it. If you don't believe me, just ask my wife. Getting advice from people who know how to listen is what better help is all about. It is therapy for the internet era, completely online, making it convenient and flexible to your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched to a professional licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time. So visit betterhelp.com slash Duke Roundup today to get 10% off your first month. 
That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Duke Roundup. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Okay, I'm going to turn that recording on. Hey, this is Donald Wine from the Duke Basketball Roundup, and y'all know me. I'm always on the go. So sometimes it's not feasible for me to cook up a big meal. That's why I'm excited that we're partnering with Factor Meals. What I'm most excited about, first off, eating better is easy with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian-approved, and ready to go in just two minutes. Yeah, two minutes. Also, they have so many options, over 35 each week. They include Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto options. Finally, they have flexible plants, which is perfect for someone like me who travels often. I can get as little or as much as I need every week, and I can pause and reschedule deliveries anytime I need. Jason, this is right up my alley. Oh, man, it really is. And if you're looking, by the way, for fast premium options with no cooking required, ready to heat and eat in two minutes, head to factormeals.com slash DukeBB50. Again, use that code DukeBB50 to get 50% off. Come on, 50% off? That code, DukeBB50 at FactorMeals.com. We've done the math, man. It checks out. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. You know, Jason, I just ordered some meals, and I can't wait to get them in and be able to eat these healthy portion meals without having to break out the pots and pans. So check out Factor Meals today. Remember, use the code DukeBB50 to get 50% off. Donald, we're back from the break, and let's get to the bad from the game against James Madison. We're we're nitpicking in a big, big way here, but I'll start with this. Uh, Mark Mitchell, frankly, was just one of six from the floor, struggled to finish inside at times. He 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 got some rebounds. You know, it, it, I'm not saying Mark, you know, had a had a terrible game or anything like that. And and Mark had four assists. I you know I've been, I should look and check. Mark Mitchell doesn't usually get a lot of assists, but yeah, uh, yeah. Four, four he's, usually not, he's usually not in that position. He's usually receiving the yeah. assist from somebody else. Exactly. Exactly. But, uh, but look, if we're, if we're looking for a complete a hundred percent, nothing but good, we got to put Mark Mitchell, at least his, you know, ability to finish in the bad. I will note this again. I said he was one of six from the floor. I remember the one basket he made. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> Jason, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that he was one for six because the one nitpicky bad thing that I had was that it wasn't necessarily about his play because, again, while he wasn't uh, as effective as he was the game before on offense, I thought he made up for it in every other facet of the game. I thought he was great on defense, great with rebounding, and it, as you mentioned, with the assists. Um, we were blocked. We had we had six shots that were blocked. You mentioned that, that Mark Mitchell was one for six from the floor, which means he missed five shots. Those five shots that he missed were all blocked. That is the only nitpicky yeah. bad thing that I have. So he was one for six. He had one one basket, and the other five shots he had were blocked. And again, it was about him being aggressive and going to the hole and trying to get uh get you know get that that easy bucket or get a foul and go to the free throw line where he's been uh, going to the line very very frequently uh, the last few weeks. But I think that's the only thing is you know one of the stats that has been in the, you know, what the red and the blue all season for us has been block percentage on offense because we do get a lot of shots blocked. Um, That was a little bit of an uncharacteristically high number for Mark Mitchell, especially considering the fact that, as I mentioned, he only missed five shots and those five shots were all blocked. So he's one for one in shots that weren't blocked. Uh, (laughs) We could take that and put him in the good for that. Um, So if he doesn't get a shot blocked, he's going to make the basket. That's kind of where we're at in this tournament. But again, I, 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 I'm saying that more as a Nick picky thing. We'd love to see him get back towards the double digits that we love seeing. Cause as we know, when Mark Mitchell hits double digits, that means Duke is doing very well. We have an incredible record over the two years that we've had Mark Mitchell when he scores in double digits, because that's the next factor that a lot of teams don't have. So I'm looking forward to seeing him rebound. We're going to need him uh, against Houston uh, to really pick up in the, in the production department on offense, as well as continue to maintain what he's been doing on defense. Yes, indeed. I've got one other minorly serious thing in the bad. Then I got a couple sort of amusing bad things I want to mention. Uh, And the minorly serious one is it it feels like TJ Power has sort of fallen out of the rotation again. 
Um, this has happened to him a couple times this year. He'll sort of rise up for a little bit and then kind of fall back, and it feels like he's fallen back a little bit. I think part of that is that Jalen Blakes, as we've mentioned, has been an absolute demon on defense. And basically, the way they're playing, you want McCain, Roach, and Proctor to be on the floor for as many minutes as they can handle. So if one of those guys is going to come off for a little bit, I think Jalen Blakes and a defensive intensity makes more sense for this team right now than TJ Power, who has a little more size, clearly isn't nearly on the same level as a defender. He's going to bring you shooting in a way, an offense in a way that Jalen Blakes can't even dream of. But frankly, the way Duke's shooting these days, I don't know that you necessarily need that that much. I think that's a lot of why TJ Power has is, you know, not getting as many minutes. But if we're being perfectly honest, if we're, you know, giving folks the bad, it is unfortunate, it is bad that TJ Power is not sort of able to earn minutes at this moment in the season. That said, I won't be surprised if Duke finds a way to use him against Houston. Um, he, he, he certainly is someone who can light it up from the perimeter when you need him to. And I, and I think, you know, John Shire, just like he's told a lot of these guys and we've seen, you know, guys fluctuate in minutes, you know, especially those bench players to just be ready. And I think he's mentioned about the fact that he's like, Hey, I've told TJ power, just be ready for your moment. I will say this was not my play of the game, but one of the play of the games that someone sent in was the fact that with 30 seconds left and TJ powers on the floor, he, he, he runs to hustle and dive on the floor for a loose ball yeah. while we're up yeah. 38 um, to try and save a possession. I think, again, those are the, the, that's what's going to, you know, make you earn more time on the floor. That's what's going to make you feel, you know, the, the coaching staff feel comfortable with putting you out there and knowing that the energy level is going to be at the level that is required to be a Duke basketball player. So uh, I, I, I think it is, it, it technically goes on the bad that he's not playing as much as we thought he would be. But I, I'm not concerned about him. I think again, when your time is called, when your number's called, be ready, and hopefully he's able to continue to produce, and even in the limited minutes that he has for us. All right. So I got, like I said, three sort of joking bad items. The first one is this: Jared McCain only played ten minutes of the second half, and because of that, he did not get a chance to match 24 year old Jack Golke of Oakland for the most three pointers in tournament history. I'm convinced that if he played more minutes, unacceptable. Yeah. Unacceptable. <laughs> yeah. I'm convinced if he played more minutes, Jared McCain would have gotten to 10 three pointers. I think there's little question about that. By the way, it's worth noting that when Jack Golke entered college, Jared McCain was still in junior high school. <laughs> mm-hmm. How are these two players playing, uh, you know, at the same time in the same tournament? Uh, my next item in the bad was we had a fast break in the second half where I thought there was a legitimate chance for another thunder slam by Sean Stewart. And we opted to take a guy open at the three point line instead. And he missed the three and that's bad as far as I'm concerned. Cause I was all here for yet another, you know, unbelievable thunder slam by Sean Stewart. We only got two of them. I was looking forward to a third one. And then the last thing I have in the bad Jim Sumner in his wonderful newsletter. If you do not subscribe to Jim Sumner's newsletter, what are you doing as a Duke fan? He pointed out there weren't enough Duke fans in the house to get a Jared's winning chant. When Jared McCain was still beating James Madison with about three minutes left in the first half, we needed a loud Jared's winning. And there just weren't enough Duke fans in the house to get that to happen, or they weren't coordinated enough. It's very unfortunate. That is that is a terrible thing that happened at this game. I must put that in the bad. So there was one... Um, uh... There's one a serious one that I have, and I think the serious one is health, right? We we kind of alluded to it, the fact that we yeah, had a guy oh, have a dislocated sure. right. finger right. and yeah. a guy who who had to enter concussion protocol. Thankfully, he doesn't it doesn't appear that he has one. But the fact that we already lost Caleb Foster, and I think Caleb Foster being out in a way might indirectly has led to some of the lack of minutes for TJ Power because we've needed to use Jalen Blake's more. Uh, instead of bringing Caleb Foster off the bench to spare one of the guards when they need rest. So I think that that part of it, like the health thing, can we not, can we go through a game where we don't have to worry about someone's health, please? That would be great. Um, that's and again, that's no fault of anybody on 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 the team. It's just it just seems like the luck of the draw this year is like every every other game we're talking about somebody getting hurt in this case, too. So hopefully both Jeremy Roach and Jalen Blakes are OK. I think the other like jokey one that I had was, man, Jason, if in the first half there was that one yam attempt from Mark Mitchell that he got he either got fouled or I think that was one where he got sort of blocked and, he, and it went off the rim. But if he had yammed that, you know how back in the day when CBS, if a game was getting out of hand, they would switch 
to like local news or maybe to another game that was on, <laughs> yeah. that would have been the moment that CBS <laughs> would have broken in and said, Hey, by the way, uh, 60 minutes is coming on. So we're going to just send you to that and we'll tell you what happened the rest of this game. Cause this one's over. I, I like that. I like that. All right, dude, time for our play of the game. I'm going to let you go first because when it's my turn, we're going to be here for a while. So give us your play of the game. Yeah. So my play of the game is uh, again, we like the sequences here on the show and and I have a sequence very early in the game. I think it was maybe eight minutes into the game. Proctor makes a three to make it 21 to nine. We go back down and on the ensuing possession, Jalen Carey gets the ball again, Vernon Carey's little brother and Jared McCain steals it from him. Jared McCain steals it. He turns around, he, he, outlets it to Proctor and runs to the opposite wing. Proctor gets the ball. He gives it back to McCain on the wing for a three. Bam. Nothing but nylon. 24 to nine. JMU calls a timeout. At that point, Jerry McCain had 12 points. He was beating JMU by himself. And it felt like at that moment for me that it was over. Because when JMU called that timeout, if you looked at their faces, they were shell-shocked. They were like, this is not what we've been doing. Again, we when we previewed them, we talked about how they've been terrorizing teams all year long, including Michigan State, right? But from the very beginning, we've been talking yep. about how this team was a problem. It was at that moment that they realized that they had a problem. And I think that was where the tide really turned and said, and for me, like, this is going to be a really fun game to watch because if the shooting is going to continue like this, where guys are getting six points in the span of 14 seconds, this game is going to be over very quickly. And so I thought that was a real crucial pivotal point in the game to signify to the world that, again, if if, if 60 minutes was able to preempt the, the rest of the game, that was the moment they were probably going to do it. All right, so my play of the game is every single three-pointer by Jared McCain. And I want to explain what I'm going to do here. Uh, if you go on YouTube, you can, you know, Google Jared McCain, NCAA tournament, something like that. And, you know, there 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 are videos of every single one of his three-pointers in this game. And it is worth looking at them because there are some really interesting ways that Duke got McCain open, that McCain worked to the right spot, that these three-pointers were not just one guy going off. It was a team effort, and I think they are fascinating to look at as individual plays. Starting with that opening possession, McCain throws it inside to Kyle Filipowski. And Jared at first stays near the top of the arc. He doesn't look very dangerous because he's pretty far away from the play. And Kyle Filipowski takes a couple dribbles and starts to get a little bit closer to the basket. And it's at that point that the guy guarding Jared McCain becomes concerned about Flip going one-on-one -on -one in the post. And so Jared McCain's man starts to, you know, look over his shoulder a little bit. He's watching Kyle Filipowski while he's also watching McCain. And as soon as he starts to do that, Jared McCain switches from the top of the key, the top of the circle over to the wing a little bit more. It means that there's a more gap. There's more space there. It also means that Jared McCain's man loses track of where Jared is. And it is at that moment that Flip tosses the ball out and Jared hits that three-pointer as another James Masson player tries to come in and help. Now, it's worth noting that Jared took that three-pointer from several feet beyond the three-point line. Most of the threes he hit were not shots taken right at the line. He was behind the line because that's the space he needed against a good James Madison team to get those buckets. Yeah, Donald. Let me interrupt you to say that that is something that if you if you watch Jeremy McCain all year, he's very good at that. He's very good at just, as you mentioned, being in one spot and moving just a couple feet to the right, a couple feet to the left, just to create, again, like you said, he's several feet beyond the arc. So I'm not a math major. And I, I know some geometry, but I know people out there know that if you're several feet away from somebody, two to three feet can create a lot of extra distance between you and your opponent. So exactly. for him just to take that one step to the left or one step to the right to create an extra five or six feet of space, we've seen how fast he can shoot a three, and that's all the time he needs. All right, so the next three-pointer he hits with about 15 and a half minutes left. This is one of Mark Mitchell's assists. We talked about the fact Mark Mitchell had four assists. Mark Mitchell grabs an offensive rebound. There are literally five James Madison guys fighting around the basket for the rebound. That's a problem because when Duke gets the rebound, that means there are guys wide open on the perimeter. And Mark is Mark Mitchell was buried on the baseline, but he makes a really fabulous one-handed jump pass to McCain, who this time is closer to the three-point line. He can be closer now. 
because there aren't defenders around him. And he buries that one with relative. It's a relatively uncontested one. Literally the next play down the court, Donald, this is the play that is a thing of beauty. If I had to pick one play all game, it would be this one. So Duke sends all the action to the near side of the court. Kyle Filipowski's going that way. Tyrese Proctor's in the corner. Jeremy Roach is on that wing. Flip has the ball up top and he goes toward Jeremy Roach. And the D is now watching everything on the near side of the court. Everyone is shaded in that direction. McCain is on the opposite wing. And Mark Mitchell looks like he's heading toward the opposite corner. And what happens is Flip gives the ball to Roach. As I said, Flip is going that, that direction. And Jeremy Roach then moves the action to the other side of the court, the far side of the court. As he's doing it, Mark Mitchell sets a screen. Now, if you're if you're watching the game casually, you wouldn't even see this screen. But Mark Mitchell sets a screen on uh, Jared McCain's man. And McCain, like you said, takes two steps down, further down the court on that far side. And suddenly he is wide open. Roach tosses mm -hmm. it over to him and bang. That is a, that, by the way, that whole thing doesn't look like a play. That was a play. Duke had that whole thing set up, all the action going one way. And then Mark Mitchell just sort of floats up from the corner, sets this little back screen. And suddenly Jared McCain is wide open for a three pointer. It was, I, I, I'm telling you, I was watching this on YouTube. I backed it up and watched it like three different times just to see where every single Duke player moved on that play. It is really easy to look at the Duke offense and think, oh, John Shire isn't doing much. It's all freelance. It's all one-on-one. -on -one. It's all dribble handoffs. Let me tell you something. That was sophisticated. That was really well-planned. They have worked on that a lot, and James Masson had no answer for it. It's like the magician play, right? Like if you, you go to a magician, they, they, they look, hey, look at the right hand. Look, there's nothing in my right hand. And all of a sudden the left hand has the bird, right? And, yeah. all of a sudden, and they, that's what it was. They, they flow, flow everybody to one side. Hey, look, all these guys over here, they're running to play from over here. Uh, I'm just joking over here. Uh, I'm, I'm throwing it to the other side. Jer Jeremy Kane's already open. And again, like I said, when, when Jeremy Kane is open, he catches the ball. There's a, there a couple times where uh, there was a guy who would start out towards him. And then realize I I don't I don't have enough ground I have too much ground to cover and not enough time to do it because as as soon as he catches the ball he was in a shooting motion so it makes it very as quick a release to, as he has it makes it even quicker because he's already in starting in the up process of shooting before he even catches the ball so when he catches it right you know have to have a great pass so you know, the to be able to find him with a perfect pass to put it right in his hand so that all he has to do is just keep going up it makes it where that shot is unstoppable. And I think that's where there was a point where it felt like uh, J uh, James Madison just kind of looked as like, we, we can't, we can't deal with that. There's no, there's no adjustment that we can do short of having three guys on them for the rest of the game. There's nothing we can do to adjust to the fact that he shoots his shot so quickly that you can't even cover the ground to stop him. Okay. The next three pointer comes at the 11 to 50 mark. That's the one you described a moment ago where Jalen Carey, is dribbling the ball. McCain strips him. They head the other direction. Tyrese Proctor gets out ahead of the play. I and and by the way, Tyrese puts on a really nice little little fake, little head and shoulder fake to to draw the defense and to to create the room for Jared McCain. Again, that is a three pointer where McCain takes it from a little bit behind the line, not giving the James Masson player you know space or room to get in his face. With seven ten minutes left, he hits his fifth three pointer of the first half. It's just a little pick and roll action with uh, Mark Mitchell. When Mitchell rolls, the defense sort of shifts a little bit toward him and gives Jared just a sliver of a moment. This is the only one that Jared McCain takes where it's not off an assist. He takes it off his own dribble, but you give him an ounce of, uh, you know, an, an inch of space. McCain's going to rise up and do that to you. And then the last one comes at two and a half minutes left in the half, in the first half. This is yet another time where a big man, we're on the Duke bigs, set a ridiculous screen very very well executed to set jared free this time mccain is at the top of the circle he does a handoff to tyrese proctor and ryan young is near the play and i know there are a lot of duke fans out there who say these dribble handoffs don't accomplish very much well go ahead and watch this play and you'll see what a dribble handoff accomplishes because with with mccain doing a handoff to proctor and ryan young nearby there's a huge bunching of the defense and on the handoff McCain sort of loops away toward the far wing of the floor and his man has to navigate through Tyrese Proctor's man, through Ryan Young, through the guy guarding Ryan Young, if he's going to stay with Jared McCain. Newsflash, that's hard to do. 
<laughs> and what happens on this play is that Ryan Young sort of sets a screen where his man and Jared McCain's man both get tangled up. And suddenly Jared McCain is wide open. So when Tyrese Proctor tosses the ball over to him, he is on fire. He has unlimited range. He may be 25 feet from the basket, but the James Madison guy has no chance to get to him because Ryan Young and Tyrese Proctor and their men have gotten in the way of the play. And that's when Jared McCain hits his sixth and final three-pointer of the first half. He had two more in the second half. One was in transition. One was for, at a moment where James Madison went zone. What were you thinking? What are you thinking, James Madison, going zone? I guess man-to-man -man wasn't working. They tried zone. It did not work. Jared McCain buried a three against them. But those six three-pointers in the first half, each and every one of them were really special. And each and every one of them involved his teammates setting him up, getting players in position where Jared McCain could take advantage of them. It was incredible to watch. And then the last thing I wanted to mention super quick was the play at if I if I had not been able to pick any of these as my play of the game, I would pick the play that happened at seven minutes and 50 seconds left in the half when Jared McCain got into the lane with a little dribble. And James Madison at that point was terrified of anything that was happening with Jared McCain. The defense mm -hmm. was paying nothing but attention to him. And Jared threw a slick pocket pass to Kyle Filipowski for a oh, wide yeah. open dunk. Woo! Yeah. That was, by the way, Donald, that was the moment where James Madison looked at each other and said, um, what are we going to do to stop these guys? I don't have a clue. Yeah, we we done here. <laughs> yeah, we done. Exactly, we done here. <laughs> that was my break? play of the game. <laughs> that I told, I told you it'd be long. Look, you know the 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 Twitter account art. You know art, but make it sports. Uh, I I wish that they would take some J Jerry McCain uh, three pointers and see if there's there's got to be some art masterpiece hanging yeah, that somewhere great, in the world. That is an incredible Twitter account. It I is think it's yes. not, it's it, on Instagram also. It's a great, it's better. Yeah, but how quickly yeah. they come up with some of them, right? Like some of them is like five minutes later. He's like, oh, it's like they had him in. I, I know exactly which which thing. I, there's definitely some art pieces around the world hanging in in some some museum that look like Jeremy Kane shooting a three pointer yesterday. So hopefully we'll see some of those soon. Look, by the way, everybody, please write in to dbrpodcast at gmail.com. And let me know if that worked. I think that that little thing I just did would have worked way better if you'd been watching the video while I was talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm trying here, people. We got, we got, you know, we're doing a, an audio podcast here. There are certain limitations that we have. But I just, I, like I said, I was watching the the video of every one of of Jared McCain's threes, and I was just like, man, there's some there's some poetry happening. There's some art happening yep. here, and I wanted to point it out. Hey, Donald, we have to do our player of the week. I'm going to go ahead and guess for you. Who's your player? I'm, I'm thinking maybe Jared McCain. 45 points, 14 for 24 from the floor, 10 threes, 11 rebounds, four assists, and two steals. Yeah, that's Jared McCain. Also, he has a university named after him now. So, like, it, it, I'm pretty sure it can't it can't be anyone other than him. I, I completely agree. And I thought Jeremy Roach had a hell of a pair of games. I mean, like, I was like, am I really not picking Jeremy Roach? And then I, then I looked at Jared McCain's stats and I went, I'm really not picking Jeremy Roach. Sorry. <laughs> It when someone's again, I think we said this earlier in the season when McCain played Florida State and he had 35 points. It's like if a guy gets 30 plus points, he's gonna get player of the week, most likely. Yeah. Like that yep. that's it's usually it's usually when you play the, the reverse card at Uno, like or the draw four card. Like, I'm sorry, <laughs> like you just gotta you just gotta accept it. Yep. So let it be written, so let it be done, as it was famously yes. said in the Ten Commandments. Jason, before we wrap up, I did want to go back to the tournament at large and I want to just give a shout out okay. to the ACC. Because the ACC, as you mentioned, I think you mentioned this. Uh, eight the no. ACC, eight no in all, regular games. Eight yeah. no, Jason. That's tied for the best record in the first two rounds of the tournament by a conference ever. Big Ten, or I'm sorry, the Big East in 2003 went eight no in the first two rounds. Of course, they're not counting the play in, so the Virginia loss doesn't count. But uh, four teams in the in the Sweet 16, and including two that a lot of people probably didn't think would be there, right? In Clemson yeah. and NC State. Yeah, and they had the most of any conference. And so I just want to say to the rest of the country, uh, remember when you said the ACC was a terrible conference and probably should only have two teams in this tournament, then both of them should be Duke UNC. Uh, find a napkin, wipe the egg off your face because the ACC is built for this. We've seen Jason the last, over the last 25 years, the ACC has had so many good teams, right? And final fours, winning national championships, getting to the sweet 16, outperforming expectations. And the, people just got to wake up and realize that you can talk about the ACC in a lot of, in, in a negative light in a lot of ways, but when it comes to the tournament, 
they are built for the NCAA tournament. And when NC when ACC teams get in there, chances are some of them are going to make some noise. And I think it's very, very cool to see. And I'm even throwing UNC into this for just a second, right? Like, I don't like them. I wish they would have lost. But I, I feel like <laughs> at the end of the day, the this all shows that the ACC is better than everybody said it had been all year long. This is the team that when you get to the tournament, they're going to shine and they are built for March Madness. So uh, congratulations to the ACC. Uh, of course, we, we're, you know, we're not going to root for some of you uh, moving forward because that's that's the name of the game. Um, but at the end of the day, the ACC doing well helps everybody in the conference. And even Cal and Stanford and SNU were probably like, yeah, see, that's the conference we're going to next year. Keep it up. Keep it up. Except for you, UNC. You, you, you've you done enough. <laughs> but by the way, bad on the committee that they've put these ACC teams in the same regions. Like mm-hmm. we have four different teams and they're all going to, they all potentially could be playing each other in the final eight. Duke and NC State in the same region and Clemson and Carolina in the same region. I mean, come on, spread us out a little bit. Give us a chance to keep on beating up on the other guys, please. That's, yeah. what, we, that's what we enjoy doing. We, we we don't like beating up on each other. We do it all year long. And for you to make us have to do it again in the NCAA tournament, it's just unfair. Um, and so I feel like they should they should look at that as well. Yeah, I'm very we're, much. We're clear. We're clearly reaching grasping the straws here. But no, I, I actually do think it's kind of cool that NC State um, getting I know they got past Oakland. Um, shout out to Oakland. But, the, you know, I think NC State getting there. I think that's one of the the major uh, I guess the, surprises the big, of the tournament. Look, it's it's all one, two, three, four seeds who are all expected to go there with the singular exceptions of uh, Clemson, of, of Clemson and, and NC State. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah. All right. So that's going to wrap it up for us here on the latest edition of the Duke Basketball Roundup. Donald Wine, Jason Evans signing off. Again, we'll be in your feeds a lot. Please tell your friends, your Duke friends out there who listen to podcasts but don't listen to this podcast. What a terrible mistake they're making. This is the time of year to be tuning in to the DVR, soaking in every word it is we have to say. Don't forget, you can email us anytime. Why am I even saying that at this point, Donald? I don't want more email. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we're going to clear out the ones from this game and then you'll be free to send more that, that's oh my, how we have to do it oh my god the email box the dbr podcast at gmail.com email box is full full all right until next time when we'll be previewing the houston cougars a team that a week ago i would have been terrified of a team that right now i'm like bring it on duke is ready for anything i'm jason he's donald here's the duke band play us out Take us all the way to Dallas, baby.